Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon I bid to our generous and honourable host, Professor Muhammad Hashim Kamali, uh, the CEO and Chairman of the Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies, Malaysia. Uh, Your Excellencies, Maria Isabel Randon, the Argentinian Ambassador, and Mr. Ong Kang Yong, the Singaporean High Commissioner. Honourable Foreign Secretaries, esteemed speakers, and distinguished guests. We would like to extend our warmest gratitudes for allowing us to host you for today's international seminar entitled Islam and Democracy, What is the Real Problem? Jointly organized by the Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies, IIS, and Islamic Renaissance Front, IRF. We have invited three venerable speakers to be our panelists for this discussion. They are Dr. Zulkifli Ahmad of PAS, Dr. Ahmad Farouk of IRF, and Professor Syed Farid Alatas from the National University of Singapore. Moderating this session will be Professor Karim Douglas Crow of IIS. Just a brief overview on the topic of discussion today. Democracy and Islam have been widely perceived as incompatible. In fact, due to the recent development in the political climate of Egypt, with Islamist President Mohamed Morsi being touted as an authoritarian figure, this further cemented the argument that Islam is supposedly inherently authoritarian. However, there are two sides to every coin, and some Islamic activists have presented an inherently democratic Islam instead. What is interesting is that both sides of the argument promote the religious texts as containing the philosophical scaffolding to support their own ideas. What we hope to put forth here today is not the argument whether or not Islam is compatible with democracy, but under what conditions Muslims can make them compatible. It is we who determine the inclusive or authoritarian nature of the religion. Therefore, without further ado, we would like to invite Professor Muhammad Hashem Kamali to deliver his opening speech. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, honorable speakers, some of them are still not here. <laughs> uh, it is a pleasure for us on behalf of IIS Malaysia to uh, welcome everyone uh, in this event. Your participation to us is always uh, very meaningful. Uh, <coughs> uh, the subject that we are uh, discussing today already made known, Islam and democracy, what are the problems? Uh, or the real problems? Both are very wide subjects. And when you put the two side by side, uh, I suppose we have to try to make some sense of it, uh, and my uh, presentation in the time that is allocated to me will start uh, on developing a perspective, an Islamic perspective on democracy. And then later I will proceed to specify some of the problematics that are there, whether from the Islamic perspective or general, I will be making comments on that as well. Uh, our purpose today is to generate an understanding. We are a research institute. Our attempt, our approach is entirely academic and research oriented. If I may say this, Election is in the air and it is on people's mind. Uh, but uh, it has very little to do with this event. The fact that the election seems to be close is just incidental. It seemed close even six months ago. <laughs> so uh, uh, we do not wish our discussion today. I speak not just on my behalf, I have also. Uh, communicated with our other uh, organizer, Islamic uh, Nations Front, and we are in agreement on this. Uh, 
Of course, all of these are uh, of key importance to us, both Islam and democracy. And I think that in recent years, uh, democracy and the human rights discourse and it has progressed over the years and has attracted attention in the Muslim world. I have seen it from direct experience and it's finding support. Although there are issues that I would refer to some of them in the course of my presentation. Uh, <coughs> uh, Democracy, of course, uh, is participatory representative government for the people, by the people, of the people. And it is all about commitment, commitment to accountability, to the rule of law, uh, to the service, people's service, their implementation. Uh, of their basic rights and liberties. Uh, and when we speak of an accountable government uh, that is committed to these values, uh, we see a line of convergence between uh, Islam and democratic thinking. Um, there, has, there is no mention or reference to any of government in the Quran or in the Sunnah for that matter, let alone a democratic system of government. But there is a, uh, there are references in the Quran to leadership matters and to uh, service serving the people, their rights, uh, and uh, in Islamic thinking. Scholars have developed ideas about Islamic governance and uh, commitment to justice uh, and uh, security, uh, an equitable distribution of the wealth in the community, and protecting the poor and the indigent. These are some of the themes. They feature prominently, both in the Quran and Sunnah, so much so that scholars have gone on record to say that government is a service agent in Islamic thinking. Um, in the Quran, we find many references to the Ummah, to the people, uh, and uh, it is the people who have. Uh, the normative standing from the Islamic perspective. This is the locus of all authority, political authority. It is the people. In the Quran we find references, denunciation of the despots and dictators of the past. Uh, the, the, the Pharaoh in the Kura and those who oppressed people and humiliated them and those who corrupted the land wherever they went. The spirit of Quran, the Quran is actually democratic. And of course, we have the mandate in the Quran, وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ that their affairs of Muslims is determined through consultation among them, between the leaders, the rulers in the rule, and throughout. This is uh, the consultative substance of government that the Quran uh, indicates. And it is very clear there has been a great deal of focus on uh, the nature of a consultative, shura oriented government. In the Sunnah of the Prophet, again, there is no particular reference to state or to a particular form of state, but there is a little, quite a great deal about how leadership in 
leaders should conduct themselves. Uh, they should be close to the people. There should be no barrier between the ruler and the rule. There is a clear hadith, Sayyidul Qawmi Khadimu, that the leader of the people is their service, is in their service. This is the democratic spirit that comes out in the early teachings of Islam about leadership. Uh, the leaders who are not involved in, the, in, 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 in what is of importance to the people, he is not anguished by the pain that they suffer and they don't share their experience, is not one of them. These are the, the kind of hadiths uh, that, that you find on record. We do not miss, wish to draw direct analogies with the remote past to say that democracy, of course, we know arose uh, in the thinking of in the French Revolution of 1789, and uh, the de democratic talk has a relatively short history, but uh, the early Khilafah, the first system or model of government in Islam, and many scholars have written to characterize the caliphate. The spirit of Khilafah is close to uh, a republican state. Leadership uh, come about. The leaders, uh, through nomination by the Ahlul Hal al by uh, the learning by the leaders of the community, uh, through consultation, and then they take the pledge of allegiance from the people, that is Bayar. So three ideas, nomination, Shura in Bayar, uh, feature prominently in the Khilafah system. And government in Islam, whether you speak of the Caliphate or any system that designates itself as Islamic, must be committed also to the value, the, the value structure of Islam. But it is also important to recall that the first caliph, Abu Bakr, in his first inaugural speech, addressed the people that I have been chosen as your leader, but I am not the best of you. Support me when I am right and correct me when I'm wrong. This is almost a literal translation of his inaugural speech. His successor, Omar al-Khattab, the second caliph, said almost the same thing. If I, if I go wrong, rectify it. That was the nature of the kind of communication that is on record of the kind of leadership that the Khilafah uh, visualized and advocated. In a sense, we find that <coughs> Islamic thinking about uh, the system of governments, they have characterized the state in Islam to be founded on shura, maslaha, and ishtiha, consultation, public benefit, public interest and to, to ishtihad, to formulate rulings, to issues as they arise. These are the three principles that uh, feature in the writings of Muslim scholars characterizing the system of government in Islam. There is a legal maxim also, Amrul Imam Manut Bil Maslah, that uh, affairs of the leader is judged by reference to the maslaha in the benefit of people. You see there is a line. You say that uh, much of this Islamic government is, is a secular government in, if you see this aspect of it. You also visualize secular, maybe uh, there is an aspect to it and I will explain that. 
that government essentially in Islam is committed to the management of the secular affairs of the people. It has very little role in aqaid, in ibadat, in worship matters, in the matters of belief, in the matters of halal and haram, in the values that you find. Uh, this is commitment in, uh, in, in a substantive sense. Uh, there is an aspect, uh, I will come to that, what we make of secularism from the Islamic perspective. But we need not to really worry about itself. M much has been made about this theoretical kind of tension that exists between democracy and an Islamic state. Uh, uh, sovereignty, for example, it has been said that it is, uh, belongs to Allah and in a democratic system of government it belongs to the people. But this has been a matter of discussion between scholars in 20th century. There are two kinds of sovereignty. One is Siyadat al-Hukum and the other is As-Sultan al tanfis The first is sovereignty that tahakkum on values that ruling, rule-making, formulation of laws on values, aqidah, ibadah, halal and haram, the state does not have a role, much of a role in it. A management role, perhaps, administration. But the role that it has um, <coughs> is in the capacity of a sultan or sultan fizi, uh, executive sovereignty, if you might, uh, uh, characterize it. Sovereignty is in any case not an Islamic idea. It is a European idea, Muslim scholars try to make sense of it, but you will find that uh, in the history of Islam, the models of governance that we have, we have all sorts of names, Khilafa, Imama, Sultana, Imara, we don't have this expression uh, uh, Islamic State, al uh, al Islamiya, which is a 20th century expression emerged in the writings of uh, Rashid Reza and others. This is representative of the sensitivity, it's not accidental, of Muslim scholars not to bring religion into the heart of politics. That is why they avoided this e expression. But then we came to the 20th century in political Islam. Uh, Islam is deen wa dawla. Uh, there was no dispute over that in the past. We recognized the place of government and the place of religion. But then uh, things changed. Uh, traditional Islam basically has very little or no problem with dem democracy. But political Islam is problematic when it says that the state and religion are the same, then immediately you have politicized Islam and brought it into the center stage of governance. Um, um, one, one other point that we may make, the value that democracy brings to us, uh, in the Islamic thought, there is one gap, there is one major gap, and that is that Muslim thinkers have not really come to conclusion over the method of succession, how the ruler of one government succeeds another. There are some methods that discuss, but there is very little consensus. There are some explanation for this. Why? Because of the prevalence of dictatorship. Uh, over the longer period of Islamic history. The situation I was earlier explaining changed. They have changed and then we had dictatorship, did not permit freedom of political thought and therefore method of succession is a lacuna. Democracy does fill that gap. It does provide a method of succession. That is based on the people's authority in expression of their political will. 
in that case it brings value and I think that uh, what are the problems of course there are some some are intrinsic to democracy and we know when democracy corrupts from within you have elections but there is no representation people are elected but they don't really are not with the people with their constituencies this is quite well known democracy also stands on a certain process in machinery institutions of democracy and these are the problematics of islamic thought we have not actually institutionalized most of what i was talking about we have talked of shura to no end of consensus in ijma of baya but we have not institutionalized those uh, ideas and therefore uh, that remains problematic um, for weaker countries in economies democracy is, uh, is difficult for them to implement uh, it is contentious parliamentary system decision making are slow uh, and uh, uh, party politics requires Uh, efficient management in organization and Muslim countries in many countries democracy runs into problem because of uh, lack of uh, attention uh, to institutions of democracy to developing civil societies civil society institution institution that uh, that uh, Uh, is committed to people's right in to standing uh, confronting the uh, coercive exercise of power the unruly exercise of power now <coughs> we have problem in those areas even in 20th century arab uh, thought uh, conclusions are that Uh, scholars muslim scholars tend to see democracy as an idea but paid very little attention to the institutions of democracy economic institutions social and political separation of power and the rules of the rule of law still we have this problem it's the rule of men not the rule of law this is our challenge accountability is our challenge and i think that government by the rule of law is a pillar of democracy without that you talk of democracy it does not really add up um, <coughs> only in 20th century or maybe a little earlier we had some institution uh, resembling parliament but uh, parliament and so on these institutional developments are really post colonial colonial development and here i am touching on some other problems what are the real problem colonialism for muslim has been a rupture with their legacy with their history of thought uh, it was it, it brought problems that we are still coming to terms with with the consequences of two or three centuries of colonial rule that sidelined Uh, Islamic thought, ijtihad, sharia, and what you have, uh, and brought Western institutions and ideas. We have the suppression of Islamic thought, and uh, um, we also have uh, in the post-colonial period there was much talk of this. constitutionalism in democracy that the colonial masters have brought to their former colonies but what we had instead was something different violence could it as military dictatorship and you have uh, a history of that uh, democracy did not strike root uh, there are of course explanations and explanations that we do not have time uh, to uh, uh, to provide that 
but uh, there came a time that uh, people were disillusioned in the Muslim world with this talk of democracy and constitutionalism. That it has not been really successful. By the 1990s, these radicalists talking about uh, uh, about responsible government and service-oriented government, they had people realized that they had not delivered, and there was this recognition that the 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 the, the middle ground should come and take the center center stage and the fundamentalists to, to take, to read, to leave. Uh, this was something for a brief period until came the 9-11 and the, the horrendous history of violence and confrontation that we have and it was a boost, uh, a shot in the arm again for the radicals and fundamentalists and political Islam. Also, post 9-11 events has given a, a poor profile to democracy in the sense that uh, uh, Western democracies, through their conduct, have uh, actually not responded to issues uh, of climate change, carbon emission, trade barriers, and of course militarism, Palestine. Iraq and Afghanistan. The result of this, the democratic state do not take, uh, uh, do not pay any attention to the democratic rights of the weaker people. This is a problem. This is a real problem. It's still continuing. What is the real problem about democracy? Yes, we have some problem of our own. But then there was disillusionment. Ever since this, uh, during the era of Islamic resurgence, uh, with, uh, with this, uh, in the 1967 Israeli uh, war, people were disillusioned with the secular leaders. And the idea came about Islam is religion in state. Al Hal al Islam, Al Islam who Al Hal, and there you are you have the rest of the political Islam unfolding with that kind of, you know, phenomena in behind it. Our, uh, when political Islam um, unfolded its agenda, it brought the legalist aspects of Islam into the center stage of politics. Yes, Sharia, we are committed to it, to some values, but the state is not all about legalism. And this became problematic. How do you merge uh, within this rubric of Islamic State, the Sharia with uh, uh, democracy? These are certain problems that remain with us. Uh, an author, Hamid Enayat, who wrote a book on Islamic government, he reached the conclusion that Islam and democracy are agreeable, provided that Islam re is re reconciled itself with modernity. That was his conclusion. But actually the essence of this statement is uh, reconciling Islam with rationalism, with rational thinking. And uh, this has a history, of course, the uh, through the long history of Islam, the confrontation between the rationalist thinking, the Mu'tazila, and the philosophers, on the one hand, in the traditional Ash'ariya, in the Ahl al-Hadith, on the other, eventually the traditionalists um, won the day. The movement, uh, the rationalist movement, was crushed as far back as the, under the Abbasi Caliph al mutawakkil in 846, um, that he then uh, oppressed uh, the rationalist thinkers, some of their books were even burnt and so on. That was a tragic uh, kind of encounter we have, but that problem is a real problem that still remains 
if we are looking for count, recounting what are the real problems of democracy, then this is one. And I think if you go to the Quran, there is much support for rationalist thinking, observation of the world around you. Open your eyes and draw your conclusions and stand by it. And I think that uh, we have a certain aspect of Islam that is faith. Faith is not a matter of rationality in any tradition. But beyond that, management of the affairs of this world, that is, uh, stands on rationalism. And I think that if you, if there is much support for that. Um, if we are saying that, uh, <coughs> Okay, maybe a brief comment, what we make of the Arab Spring. I think again, you know in I know, it is still an unfolding scenario. Unfortunately, it has, uh, it has uh, uh, now been confronted with difficulties. Again, coming from those, those long-standing dictators, instead of them uh, 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 apologizing to their people, they are sticking to their old methods and that is the problem. That is the problem. When the leaders become misguided, committed to, uh, to that kind of intransigence, then that is the problem. And I think that uh, culture, Arab culture, perhaps has something in it that uh, it does not commit itself to the rule of law. It is the rule of men. I think we have that generally, but until we change this, problematics will remain. Accountability, I think that is uh, essential. Uh, some of the gains of Arab Spring, I think, has generally been said, generally been said, that are irreversible. That people can now speak more or less openly over their, the issues of concern to them. I think I have taken more than my time and occasion. I thank you. Assalamu alaikum.